Awesome. Welcome back, folks, to another Rev Real Estate Live. We've been doing these webinars for probably about two months now, and it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. So um, if this is your first time tuning in, welcome. And if you're reoccurring, thanks for coming back. That that lets us know that we're providing value and, and helping you out in some way. So my name is Dallin Schultz. I will be the host of, of this webinar. And it, it changes from week to week. Um, the, the base and purpose of this webinar, we don't solicit any deals on this. Uh, the, this webinar is strictly for education and content for people that are either looking to get actively in the space or those looking to just passively invest in, in real estate. So at the end of the day, we believe that there's not and feel that there's not enough education and content out there around alternative investments. And what we focus on is investments specifically in the apartment communities and the multifamily space. So that's where all of our information and content, that is what it is geared towards. Now, typically in the past, if you've been with us, we've asked that questions, just throw it in the chat box and then we'll address it towards the end of the webinar. We'll open it up to a live Q&A. However, with today's content, what I will be going through is there's a lot of information. There's a lot of steps, a lot of different things that we'll be covering. So rather than wait until the end to pose those questions, because we're going to be moving through a timeline here, if you have a question that pertains to that topic that we are speaking about, please ask it. And what you can do is you could still throw it in the chat box. And I have three people on my team here with me. We got Paul, Jim, and Hillary. They'll be monitoring those comments. And if you're tuning in live to this, same thing. Feel free to, to message a comment and we have a team member monitoring that. So that way we can make sure your questions are addressed. If, if I feel like it's a little too deep or maybe in the weeds, I might just kindly suggest that we follow up after this call just so we can keep things moving along um, because that we'll be we'll be scratching the surface on a lot of aspects today. So appreciate you jumping on and uh, and this week we don't have a guest speaker. I am your guest speaker, so I'm looking forward to to presenting and sharing with you uh, all something that's very passionate to me and something that I've literally dedicated my my life to now. Um, not starting from a real estate background. So I really enjoyed the education and letting people know um, that the power of, of multifamily investing. So we're going to be doing a couple things today. I'm going to be showing some stuff on my whiteboard here, writing it down. Feel free to take notes, take pictures. And then I'm also going to share with you a couple things from my desktop. So I'm going to be up and around and, and moving around. I am using a lapel mic. So Jim, Paul, or Hillary, what I would ask of you is if for some reason the battery dies or I'm no longer coming through, then wave your hand, do something, let me know. So that way we can make sure it's addressed. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, and jump into it. So today what we're going to talk about is the process of acquiring a large apartment building. And we're, we're not going to be talking about your 10 units or 20 units. That's that's there's a little bit different strategies there, even though there's a lot of overlap. What we're going to be talking about is getting into a $10 million plus building upwards to 20, 30, 40 million dollars, because the processes and flows are a little bit different, especially if you're looking to passively invest with an operator or into a deal like this. It's very important to understand what goes on, what goes on before you as a passive investor even hear about the deal. And I feel like a lot of this is, is missed or overlooked. And so that's what we're hoping to cover today with you is just helping, like pulling the curtain back and, and helping you understand and see what it is that operators actively do before you might even hear about the deal. So I do have some notes here that I will refer to because I want to make sure I don't miss anything since there's a lot of content I want to cover. Um, am I coming in okay? I want to make sure. Yes, you are. I'm not. Okay. Okay. So we got a couple different phases here. If you guys could see my timeline here, what we have. 
I apologize for my chicken scratches, but hopefully between me verbally telling you and you seeing it, you can see what it is. So a couple phases here. We got the deal sourcing phase, and then we have the uh, equity raise over here. So these are our phases. These are ongoing processes. And this is why I put them down below here. Now, my little hash marks here are going to be different things that happen along the way. For example, over on this end, this is where you close on the deal. And then over here, actually, when it comes to deal sourcing, having a hash wasn't really appropriate. We should have an an arrow because deal sourcing doesn't start at a specific time. That's something that's that's ongoing. So you got your deal sourcing and equity raise. Something important to, to recognize and realize is when it comes to deal sourcing, you don't just call up a broker and get a deal the next day. That doesn't happen. And when I when I'm talking about brokers, I'm talking about real estate brokers in the multifamily space. If you're one, if you're going after 10 units, 20 units, you'll likely work with maybe more residential real estate brokers. You might even go direct to seller. But as you get into the larger, the, the larger unit size and asset size, the way you source these deals is through brokers. Is this big enough, Jim, or do I need to write a little bit bigger? Oh, I can I can read it. Okay. Um, and this this happens through brokers. And like I said, you can't just call up a broker and say, "Hey, my name's Dallin. What what properties do you have for sale? I'm looking to buy." You can, but as I said, this is an ongoing process. This can take months to years to build these relationships with with brokers. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. And there's three things that brokers are really looking for, in my opinion, as an operator at, when you go in. Number one, is experience. And we'll expand on these a little bit. Number two, money. And number three is grit. Brokers, as you, as you initiate a conversation with a broker, they're interviewing you. They're interviewing you as an operator. And these are things that through their conversation, they're gonna be looking for. What's this person's experience? How much money do they have? And the grit, are they, are they able to push through? Because if anyone's been involved in commercial real estate or any sort of real estate, it never goes as planned. Things always come up, challenges always come up. So is this person, do they have the grit to push through whatever challenges may arise? And they're often ones that we don't expect and come when least expected. And the reason they look for these three things, because there's one thing a real estate broker is looking for, and that's to close the sale. Real estate brokers, they're not on a salary. It's commission-based, it's results-based. So they're looking for operators, building relationships with operators that have experience, money, and grit so that they could increase their chances of, of closing the asset. So these are important things to recognize, even as a passive investor, because this is what your operators are doing day to day. This is what your operators are spending hours, week after week, building and nurturing these relationships. And these things are important. Experience. So for example, early on in my career, I, I joined this mentorship group and I'm not anti-mentorship groups at all. I think there's a lot of value that can, uh, that can come in through those. But I joined this mentorship group and they they shared with us a cookie cutter, this is what you wanna ask your broker for. And so as a new newer investor, went to this commercial brokerage office, set up a meeting, went in there, started having a conversation and they asked what we're looking for. 
And which is, I think, one of the first questions most brokers ask, because just by asking that question, they can gauge your experience as an investor. So they ask what we're looking for, and we spit out that cookie cutter response that we were, that was shared with us through our mentorship program. Now, here's the deal with the real estate. Not all real estate and not all, all markets are created equally. So this cookie cutter criteria that they shared with us may have worked in their market or in neighboring markets. But I live in Phoenix. We're a completely different market in itself. Very high appreciation. So if you're looking for cash flow, Phoenix may not be the place that you want to invest. But if you're looking for big upside, it very likely is. So I get in there and I share with them this cookie cutter response that was shared with me. And as, as I was sharing that, I saw them like put their pencils down and sit back in their chair. And that's when I realized they, they knew, they picked up on my lack of experience. So a couple things with experience, all right? Personal experience I didn't have at that point. Personal experience is good, but if you're newer to the space, you can also partner up with people that have more experience. These things really help build your resume. And then um, industry jargon. That's another thing that brokers are looking for. If you get in and you start talking to them and, and you don't know what cap rate is and you're not using all these, these terms that are well-known in the space, they're going to pick up right away on that and they're going to be a little bit more hesitant to give you their good deals. So all, all this stuff, again, it takes time. Um, another important thing is market knowledge. I mentioned that all markets are created differently. And so in one market, you might be able to get an asset at an 8% cap rate. You come over to Phoenix and you ask these brokers for a property that's trading at an 8% cap rate, and they're going to laugh at you because we're at 4%. Back a year ago, it was under 4% when interest rates were so low. So having market knowledge is so important in building these relationships with the brokers. So that's your experience there. It could come from yours, it has to be there, or you can leverage somebody else's. But make sure you have that experience when you go in. Money, again, this all plays into the broker's desire to close on a deal. Typical deals at this level uh, occur through the process of syndication. Operators find the deal, they have a network, and they go to their network and say, hey, we got this deal, would you like to come invest with us? So that happens right here under equity raise. So what I'll put up here, this is your PSA, your purchase sales agreement, that's signed. So typically when you have your PSA or your LOI, which is your letter of intent, um, accepted, that's when you go to your network and say, hey, we have this deal, do you want to invest? Now, all this is disclosed to the broker and to the seller. Because in traditional real estate and in single family real estate, you got to have a proof of funds. You got to have a proof of funds saying, hey, we could close on this deal. In commercial real estate, with them being much bigger, they're a little bit more lenient on that. You don't necessarily have to have a proof of funds, but you have to have a proof of raising capital. And so that could come through experience, through your network, and you let them know, hey, we have a network. We've done this 10 other times. Our most recent deal was a $30 million purchase, and we had to raise $10 million. So these are conversations, and, and we did that in 30 days. So these are conversations that you're having with the broker beforehand. So the, the money, it can be your own or it could be somebody else's. Now, most operators do put in a significant amount of money into their current deals, but it's typically not enough. So if there's a, a $10 million raise from the general partnership group, you might see anywhere from, everyone's a little different, half a million to a million dollars going into that deal of the 10 million. That means the remaining 9 million comes from private investors. So the money can be other people's. And it's and that's very much the case in these larger deals. And that's what makes multifamily a lot of fun because it's a team sport. You get operators, 
you get investors, you come together and collectively you take down a much larger asset than you would be able to do on your own. One of the benefits and one of the things that we're actually transitioning into in the Rev is setting up a fund model. And what I mean by that is we're gonna raise the capital before we find the deal. And the reason we've decided to do that is because when we go to the brokers and have these conversations, now we don't have to tell them, hey, we got to still raise the capital before closing. Now we have the conversation saying, hey, here's our proof of funds. We have a fund. We got $10 million in that. We're ready to go. And that's an important thing to consider when you're looking to invest with operators, because if a broker has two operators, they have comparable experience. One already has the money ready to deploy, and the other one has to go out and raise it. Coming back, excuse me, to the surety of close, who, who is the broker most likely going to vouch for more to the seller? And these are just things you got to consider as you're looking to invest. So you got to experience money, and then you have the grit. Stuff happens. Challenges come up that you don't expect. And one of our deals we got into a couple of years ago, we got a letter from the lender saying, hey, we like the project, we wanna move forward with it. So we're, we're about 15 to 20 days into our inspection period and the lender comes back and says, hey, we, we look deeper into the numbers and, and we can't do this. And I said, what do you mean you can't do it? They're like, the numbers don't work. I said, you told me the numbers worked earlier, like what changed? And they weren't giving me a clear response. And it was extremely frustrating. So we're about 20 days into our 30, we had a 30 day, 45 day inspection period. So I was like, well, shoot, we got to go out and get another lender. So we went out, talked to another lender, spent a good three or four days getting them all the information on the property. They sent a letter to me saying, yep, we like it. We'll do it. And I said, awesome. Great. We get into it. 14 days later, they come back and they say, hey, we're, we're not going to do this deal. I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to do this deal? They're like, hey, the, the, the numbers don't work for us. I said, well, can you help me understand? Because based on what I shared with you in our previous conversation, we were ready to go. And again, I couldn't get a clear answer from them. And it was really frustrating. And what you might find with some institutions is it's not just one person making the decision either. With these larger banks and institutions, it's a board of people. And so when they come to you and say no, it's you're not very likely changing their mind. And so now we're about 40 days into our, I think it was a 30-day inspection period, but we did work in some, uh, some extensions that we were able to, to utilize. So we finally got into a third lender, went through the same process, and they were able to help us close. We closed on that deal one day before our contract expired. One day before our contract expired. That was not a fun experience to go through at all. But in conversations now, when we're talking to brokers and they, they ask about challenges, we can subtly slip that experience in so that they can gain confidence in our ability to close. All this stuff is so important in building a relationship with the broker. And it's all because everybody wants to get to the finish line. They wanna close. That's a seller, that's a broker, that's the buyer. So this deal sourcing too, like I said, this doesn't happen overnight. Deal sourcing, we, we have a deal that we've worked on where our partners spent six months trying to get the deal under contract, six months. Now, some of these might take a year or you might put in an offer, they decide to go with someone else and then they take it off market or that person can't follow through and it comes back to you. So this deal sourcing can take anywhere from, just from getting a deal can take anywhere from two months to, to two years sometimes. So there's a lot of work and effort. And along the way, every time you find a deal, the operator is underwriting it. 
they're underwriting it, they're determining a purchase price, they're submitting an LOI. A LOI is a letter of intent. It's a non-binding contract, non-binding letter to the, to the seller saying, hey, here's the price we're comfortable coming in at. And if they accept that, then you move into a purchase sales agreement. But during this time, you're underwriting and submitting LOIs. You might submit 20 LOIs and they not go any and they don't go anywhere. This is a lot of time and energy spent on the operator's side to ensure that we can get here. We can get a deal under contract. Any questions about this before we move on to the next the next phase here? Paul, was there anything in the chat box? Nothing yet. Okay. So if everyone's good, we're, we're going to keep moving ahead. If a question comes up regarding this, um, and, and over the next few minutes, again, just feel free to put it in the chat box and we can come back to it. So what I'm going to do now, um, we talked about underwriting, underwriting and submitting LOIs. Under, underwriting and knowing how to underwrite multifamily deals in my opinion, is an essential skill set that everyone, everyone on the team needs to know. Whether you're a passive investor, whether you're a general partner, maybe you're just helping to raise some capital, maybe you're managing the asset, everybody needs to know how to underwrite a deal. Because when you when you submit these offers, it's based on the, the financials of the property. And what you have to do, it's so much more than just plugging and chugging. And we could spend weeks just going through analyzing deals. That's not the purpose of this webinar. Um, but I do wanna stress how important that is. Now, in regards to the numbers, you've gotta figure out the story behind the property. It's your job when you're underwriting that deal is to, to determine what the narrative is based on the numbers. So it takes very analytical minds to, to be very effective and efficient with this. I am effective at underwriting. I am not efficient at underwriting. That's why we partner up with people that are. So what I want to do is share with you, uh, just in short, a couple things to look for that I feel like are some of the, the biggest key indicators and things to consider when you're looking at a deal. Again, whether you're passively investing or actively investing. So what I'm going to do is share with you a property that we actually underwrote and looked at a couple of years back. So one thing about underwriting too is one of my favorite quotes regarding underwriting um, was from a fund manager. And he said, I got so good at underwriting deals that even I started believing the numbers. And I think that's important to consider and to understand that, again, these are numbers and it's projections of what could be. And this helps formulate the business plan. So with that being said, no one's ever going to present a deal to you where the numbers look bad. It's not going to happen. I guarantee it. So it's your job as an investor to do your due diligence and know what questions to ask. So what I'm going to do here is share with you a, a, a potential return, and then we're going to change four numbers. As you can see on the spreadsheet here, okay, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty intensive. There's a lot of information, a lot of tabs, okay? We're going to change four numbers um, and just show you how drastically the deal changes, and we're not going to change it by very much, okay? So what I want to draw your attention to right now is this equity multiple in purple, this 3.06. So what that is, if you look at the LP cash flow, the way this deal is underwritten, this was a development deal we were looking at. What this is indicating is that you, as a passive investor, are gonna triple your money in the time frame of this deal. And this deal, we're looking at a five-year hold, which is pretty typical for these large assets. So what that means is if you put in $100,000, by the end of five years, collectively in total, you will have received $300,000 back. You tripled the money that you put in. 
So that's a return of your hundred thousand plus a two hundred thousand dollar profit. That's a pretty dang good return. And I'm not going to get into IRR. That can be a, a complicated metric to to um, explain to people, but feel free to to look it up and better understand it. But a good IRR for a typical passive investment, you're looking at fourteen to eighteen percent. Just to give you a range, this deal is projecting close to a 27% IRR. Pretty good, right? This is a deal that I would definitely catch my attention and, and I would look further into if I was an investor. But we're going to change four numbers here. Okay, so, so follow along with me. So first one we're going to look at is stabilized rents. So this column here on our spreadsheet, this is showing what, what we believed the rent to be. What we believe the rent to be after this project was developed. So for the two bed, three baths, we're looking at 2,200. For the three bed, three baths, 2,500. And these were townhome style type of, um, type of apartments. So this is what we're gonna do. Um, actually, let me go back here. Um, Mike, you mind helping me out here for a second? Yeah, what you need. So this 3.06 and this 26.9 IRR, can you write that down, make note of it? Yeah. Because I'm going to start changing numbers here and I'm going to forget what those are. Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go back. Let's say this project got developed and we could only rent the two bedrooms for 2,100 and the three bedrooms for 2,400. So we only decreased rent $100 a month. That's it. So that's your first number, okay? To look at where are their stabilized rents and are they within reason? Do they have some cushion there? And this is something you could do as an investor uh, very easily on your due diligence. Go to apartments.com get online, do some secret shopping, find an apartment complex or community that's similar to the one that's being presented to you and see where their current rents are and do some comp shopping. Super easy to do. A lot of it is, is free on the internet, okay? So number one, stabilize rents. Let's assume that the rent, again, dropped $100. Up here, let's assume that this, this operator put in an 8% rent growth year over year. Now, that's high in my opinion. And they might come back and justify saying, yeah, but here in Phoenix, we've been experiencing 10 to 12% year over year for the last three or four years. So we're being conservative with this number. But what's happening in the real estate market right now? And not just real estate, but in the market, things are shifting. So let's assume that they only got 3% not the 8% of rent growth year over year. So that's another, that's another metric to, to look at, okay? So you have your stabilized rents, and then you have your rent growth percentage year over year. Two to 3% is typically what, what I would be looking for when looking at deals. Because even if the rent is eight, nine, 10% growth over the year, what does that mean? That's all upside, that's all bonus. Right. So just some things to consider. Last two numbers we're going to look at on this sheet is the reversion cap rate. I don't want to get into cap rate in too much detail on this call. The important thing I want you to understand and realize is the inverse relationship between cap rates and the price. As cap rates go down, values go up. As cap rates go up, values come down. So when we underwrite deals, we always throw in a reversion cap rate, meaning, hey, we may have bought it at 5% today, but we're going to assume that it sells for 6%, trades at a 6% cap rate five years from now. That's a reversion cap rate. And as I mentioned, as cap rates go up, values go down. So we're working into our models that, hey, yes, we're buying it at this price, and even though we're going to be increasing rents, the cap rate is actually going to increase. So the overall value isn't going to be as strong as it was 
at the time of purchase. And I know that could get a little confusing and I, and I hope I didn't confuse anyone, but just bear with me here, okay? So stabilized cap rate in this model, we have it at four and a half percent. Let's assume that the market dips, shifts like it is and cap rates start going back up. Let's say it goes to 5%. Now, rule of thumb when it comes to cap rate, industry norm is 10 to 15 basis points per year. So what that means is if the stabilized cap today was at 5% and we're saying we have a reversion cap of 10 basis points per year, that's 0.1%. So in five years, that would give us a reversion cap of 5.5%. So with the market shifting, let's say a more realistic approach is not 15%, that would be very significant, 0.15% per year that that asset is held. So what that works out to be, pretty dang small. So in year five, that works out to be a cap rate of 5.75. We purchased it at a 5%. I'm just showing you where that comes into play. So you got the cap rate. Another big thing you want to keep an eye on. The last thing I want to draw your attention to, especially right now, is the financing that these operators are pulling on these properties. Where are their interest rates? Is it locked? Is it floating? Is it fixed debt? Is it a bridge loan? We could do a whole nother webinar just on that. And in fact, we do in a couple of weeks and we'll have a lender that'll be, that will be coming on talking to us about the current market. So if that's something you want to get more current on, then be sure to join us in a couple of weeks. But so let's say um, when this deal was initially presented, if you look, where's my interest rate at? Right here. No, that's the cap. Um, interest rate, 5%. Let's say the loan, the lender comes back before you actually close and they're like, hey, it's actually going to be 5.5%. So your interest rates, your debt service is going to cost a little bit more. Okay. So I know that was a lot we went over, but really it was four numbers. So I'm going to review that. Okay. Your stabilized rent, we only decrease that by $100 a month. The rent growth, we changed from 8% to 3%. So that, that was a 5% drop, okay? Then we talked about the reversion cap rate. Rather than, um, rather than a stabilized cap of, did I change? Yeah, yeah. So rather than doing a reversion cap at 10 basis points a year, it was 15 basis points per year, and then the lending. So let's go back to the return summary. So on the board here, we got before, and after. Mike, what was the IRR? 26.92. 26.92. Okay, we'll just put 26.9. And what was the equity multiple? 3.06. 3.06. Now, as you can see, the IRR, just with those few changes we made, is 3.2% with an equity multiple of 1.17. Meaning, if you put $100,000 into this deal, you're only getting $117,000 back over five years. Not a really good investment. Is it? And I and and listen, like my the whole point of of sharing this with you is not to to scare you away from from apartment investing by any means. This is something that I feel like is one of the best hard assets that you can invest in. That's the most recession resilient. But I share these numbers with you to show you, just by changing four numbers by a small degree, can make or break the deal. So as an investor. That's why it's so important for you to, number one, partner with the right people. 
make sure you're connecting with operators that have this dialed in, that know the market, they know the numbers, and they have a team around them that can project best case, right? Or, or, or a conservative, provide a conservative underwriting. At the end of the day, stuff happens, right? Stuff happens and, and we do our best as operators to project out conservatively what this could look like. So what does that mean for you as an investor? If you come into this deal and you see that the rents are within reason, that the rent growth is, um, is 3% and not 8%, and the, the interest rates are what you understand to be current in the industry right now, and the numbers look better than what they do now. They look better than this, this 3.2 and 1.7. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a 16% IRR and a 2x equity multiple, which is pretty, pretty common. You'll see that that range quite a bit. If you see them taking this conservative approach and you're still hitting these numbers, that is a good indicator that this is a healthy deal. Because what that means is they're they're meeting in the middle, right? So if they do experience 8% growth, if cap rates drop rather than increase, they're going to sell that property for quite a bit more. So if this is the conservative approach and the market's on an incline, then it's not unlikely for you to hit these numbers maybe in two years versus the five years. And we've seen that a lot. Now with the market shifting, that's where you got to be even more diligent in saying, okay, what's the operator's approach? Are they, are they conservative enough on this deal? And, uh, and that's where you just want to be, be uh, cognizant of, of where they need to be with those numbers. Excellent. Hopefully that was helpful. There's a couple of things I wanted to go over, but before we transition into the next part, and, and as you can see up here, that underwriting stuff that I talked about, that's happening at every one of these hash marks. So that's happening on a weekly basis with, with operators until they find that deal that fits their criteria. Because any good operator is not in the business of losing investors' capital. Our entire success in business is built around making investors' capital, and making them a profit. So if somebody's underwriting a lot of deals and they're not penciling out, that's probably a good thing because that means they're, they're putting their investors' interest front of mind. But it's a delicate balance you have to walk. But before we move on um, to the next phase or the next part of this, any questions regarding underwriting? Alan, I just have a comment, not so much a question, but I, I appreciate you sharing all that. I'm our senior underwriter with our company, and it is incredibly easy and, and scary, frankly, how easy it is to make a deal look good just by pulling a few levers that an unsophisticated person might not recognize. So yeah, if, if people won't share their underwriting with you and talk through it like that, then that is a huge red flag. Mike, I, I appreciate that. And honestly, I probably should have asked you to give this part of the presentation because you, you probably could have done a much better job no, than, than I did. Um, but no, th absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. It's, again, this is when, when we vet deals, because we partner up with people, when we vet operators or when we vet deals, this is our method that we go through and it should apply for everyone. Number one, we start with the operator. Who is the operator? What's their experience? Then secondly, we look at the market. What's the market been doing over the last 15 to 20 years in that city? And we, we target these markets that have experienced an upward trend of growth and population and job growth and household income and household value over the last 20 years, not the last two or three years or four years. We look at these longer trends. So we look at the operator, we look at the market, then we look at the deal. And that's why it's so important as, as you're investing and getting involved in this type of, of asset class, it could be extremely powerful if you know what you're doing and if you have some of that experience and knowledge or you partner up with the right people. And that's where you can really shorten that, that learning curve is by connecting with people 
that are already doing it. Now, it's not uncommon for passive investors to come into a deal that want to be active down the road. They want to be in the operator position. They want to be doing what, what we're doing. But it's not uncommon for them to get in passively into a deal because they get exposure to that operator and those systems that they want it outside of it. So that's not uncommon to experience either. So if you do want to be active, a good way to, to get started is to get passively in a deal first, because then you can see how some of these things are done. And if you're giving your hard earned capital to an operator, that entitles you to questions. That entitles you to questions and, and to ask the, the tough questions. And if that operator is not willing to give you the time of day to explain those things to you, that would be a red flag, in my opinion. So it, it's a way to get started. But Mike, awesome comments. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, All right. Well, this last little bit here in the last few minutes. Um, so we talked about the deal sourcing. We talked about underwriting. You submit an LOI. The LOI is non-binding contract. They say, hey, we like those terms. Let's have our attorneys draft it up into a purchase sales agreement. That PSA is the legally binding document. Once that is executed by all parties, you are officially under contract. And what happens is when this LOI gets accepted by the operators as a passive investor, that's where you get dinged in your email. And you see that, hey, Mike Herman and his team just got this LOI accepted. Here are some rough numbers be a lookout for the actual PSA and the actual um, information on that deal. So when the LOI gets accepted, that's when people, the network, the equity raise begins. And actually, I spoke too soon. That's not when the equity raise begins. Equity raise begins all the way back here. And it's a very, very much so an ongoing process. I, I've heard this uh, the statement, and I, I disagree wholeheartedly with it. Um, I've been told in the past that if you find a good deal, the money will come. And some of us have have likely heard that. Um, what was shared with me recently is as I was discussing this, somebody said, well, yeah, in the single family space, that is the case. And I don't have any single family experience, so I thought it was interesting. Because in his situation, he has experienced that. He finds a good deal and the money will come, whether that's a flip, a wholesale, something like that. In the multifamily space, it's not. Because you're not dealing with $100,000. You're dealing with millions of dollars. And you got to often raise that money. So from the time the PSA is signed to the close date, this is often... Forty-five to sixty days. So if you have a ten million dollar raise, trying to raise ten million dollars in forty-five to sixty days, some people can do it overnight. But it's because they've been raising capital for years. So what does it take to raise capital? Number one, you got to have a network. You absolutely have to have a network of people that know, like, and trust you, especially as as we talked about the underwriting, okay, you got to build a relationship as a passive investor with an operator that has this dialed in and is willing to educate you and help you understand it. Because confused clients don't, don't buy. Confused investors don't invest. It's important to know what it is that you're getting involved in. So building this network takes time. Ask me how I know. It takes a lot of time to build a network of people that know, like, and trust you. And it doesn't happen overnight. Number two, you got to have experience. And not just experience in, in a, a apartment investing, but you got to show results as well. So just because somebody's purchased a few properties in the last couple of years, how are those performing? And did they purchase it? at the height of the market where everyone looked like a rock star investor or do they have more experience? Have they been doing this for five to 10 years? Have they been through the previous downturn? 
right? Those are things to look for. And again, apartment investing is a team sport. So the person you're talking to, you're connecting with may not have 15 years of experience, but their partners do. And if that's the case, say, okay, I want to meet your partners. You're entitled to that as an investor to get to know the people that you're giving your hard-earned capital to, okay? Experience with results. Number three is exposure. If you're going to raise capital effectively and efficiently, you have to have exposure. People need to know who you are. So that coupled with the experience and the network, that enables these operators and teams like ours to close on these deals in 45 to 60 days. That doesn't happen overnight. That takes a lot of work. If there's anything you took away from what I shared with you today, this, again, this is, okay, this is, I'd say, 10% of, of taking down a multifamily asset or 10% of the overall project. Once you close on this deal, that's when the real work kicks in. So even with all this stuff going on, this is just a, a small part of the overall process of investing in, in multifamily invest uh, in apartments. But this is where you need to begin. And for all this work that they're doing and the years they're spending getting to know brokers, building capital, honing in their underwriting, right? Going through all the challenges and failures. This is stuff passive investors don't hear about. This is stuff that's not often talked about. And so what happens is at the close, you'll see this very often in, in these larger deals, you'll see an acquisition fee that the operators take. And this might be one to 2% of the purchase price of the acquisition cost. So what does that look like? If this was a $20 million asset and the operations team took 2% of that, that's gonna be about $400,000 that that person will get at closing. And this is something that I see quite often. From the, from the investor's point of view, right? The property, the purchase starts here. And so in the investor's mind, they only go 45 to 60 days, they close and the operations team gets almost half a million bucks for one to two months worth of work. It's not uncommon to, to have your investors express that concern. We've experienced it ourselves. So part of this webinar and, and the reason for it was to help everyone better understand really what goes in to the project before the PSA is even signed. This, this 400,000 wasn't earned in 45 to 60 days. It was earned over years of relationship building, expertise and experience to make sure that a quality asset is presented to an investor base so that they can get around a 2X equity multiple. And, and this is stuff that it's all disclosed. It's talked about, nothing's hidden. <clears throat> that's what's required in all the legal documents. But I just think that's important to, to touch on as well, just so people understand where a lot of it comes from. And not to mention this 400,000, if there's four, five, six partners taking down this deal on the GP team, that 400,000 isn't going to one person. It's getting split up to all the people that are involved in the general partnership. And if you talk to people enough that are doing this, this money keeps food on the table. It keeps the lights on and it keeps food on the table because there's a lot of ongoing costs and expense that occur and that's what helps keep the business running forward. And the reason that's so important, okay, like I said, we just talked about to the closing point. If this deal is held for five years, it's very likely that the ownership team isn't going to see a penny of any of those of the cash flow. Because the way these deals are often structured is that almost all the cash flow flows into the passive investors because they are placed at a priority. And it incentivizes the operators to do an efficient job to make sure 
that, that the property performs. So they might go five years without seeing another dollar presented to them from this specific deal. So that's why those acquisition fees are important and expected. And if you're, and, and if your um, operator isn't taking an acquisition fee, I would ask why and make sure there's enough reserves and capital and operating capital on their side to help out with the deal if it starts going south. So you might want to get into a deal because the operators say, hey, we're not taking an acquisition fee. And you're like, oh, that's great. That's $400,000 being left in the deal. Okay. What if crap hits the fan in six to 12 months? Does that operations team, do they have deep enough pockets and operating capital to help carry this property through whatever downturn or whatever else is, is being experienced? So just things you want to consider and think about as you're getting into deals. And with that, folks, that uh, that's what I wanted to, to cover on this webinar is just really going through everything that goes into acquiring a deal up until the day you close. Now, in future webinars, we are, we're going to take we're going to keep taking it on. So, OK, so what happens at close? To the point that you decide to sell, but hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, I appreciate you all tuning in. And we, we've got a few minutes left, so happy to answer any questions anyone has. You know what? I forgot one thing. I was going to share this with you guys, and I forgot. So um, this is a, a checklist that our team put together for uh, a template of a checklist that our team put together. This is through monday.com with how much I talk about monday.com with people you'd think I was an affiliate for them, but I'm not. It's just something that our team has, has really dug into and utilized. So this is a checklist we put together that has after the accepted LOI, what needs to happen. And so we have a due date and then a status and we can toggle this um, if it's complete or working on it. So uh, as you can see here, there's, I mean, there's probably 30, 40 steps here just from when the LOI is accepted right here until you close. So these are things that need to happen over those 45 to 60 days. So you got an LOI to the attorney, create the PSA, customize terms buyers, you got your GP roles, PSA to broker, uh, Google Drive folder to share with your other partners, review the purchase sale, the PSA with the attorney, sign it, uh, we prepare for due diligence, coordinate site visits, get plane tickets, hotel. There's a lot of work that goes on in these 45 to 60 days. So having this checklist has really been beneficial so that we can keep our, our progress and our partners, we can keep it in line. With that being said, I'm not going to go through every one of these steps. I just wanted to show you a, a useful tool that we have. And what I'm willing to do is since all of you took time out of your days to, to connect and to join us on our webinar, I have exported this to an Excel sheet and I'm happy to share it with you. So again, it's just a simple checklist. You can customize it. it, it it's likely not fully comprehensive, but it's going to get the bulk of the information that, that you'd be looking for during that phase. So this is what we're gonna do. If you would like this, let me throw it in here. So if you would like that spreadsheet, you can go ahead and email Hillary at Rev Equity Group. I just threw it in the chat box. Um, just, just email her, let her know, hey, I was on the webinar and uh, would like to get that, that checklist uh, that, that Dallin offered. And we'll, we'll send you the Excel spreadsheet for that. So since we've already put it together, there's really no reason for you to create one, um, but you can also add your own and, and customize it any way you'd like. So again, offering that to, to all of you because you decided to, to come and join us today. And if you're tuning in live, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, or any of our other platforms, same thing. Um, so feel free to, um, 
to message or email Hillary. That's H-I-L-A-R-Y at Rev Equity Group. And we'll make sure you get a copy of that. So, well, excellent. Um, again, I appreciate you all for, for jumping on. Um, I'll, I'll ask one, one last time if there's any additional questions or, or comments. I, I wanna make sure everyone feel like they got value out of this, uh, this webinar today. All right, well, I'll take the silence as, 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 as a good job on my part, I guess. I guess I answered a lot of those questions. So appreciate you all jumping on. And uh, we, we will send out this recording. So if you'd like to review this information, that will come out next week in our Tuesday's email. So uh, we welcome you and, and excited to have you join us on future webinars and appreciate you tuning in today. Take care, folks.